Hey there guys, I hope everybody's doing well out there. Today I wanted to change it up a bit and start a new biblical series. I haven't done this in a little while and I'm going to call it the teachings of Jesus Christ. I want to start off in the Gospel of John because that's the most sensible place to start off. And frankly speaking, the topic of the deity of Christ keeps coming up as far as important theological topics go. This one is just all over the place right now. I've never seen it challenged so much and so openly by so many prominent people who claim to be Christians. And I'm not starting this series because I just want to talk about the deity of Christ. I was actually reading a different chapter of John the other day, and that's what made me want to do this. But it does seem fitting that my last video mentioned the fact that Brandon Tatum was claiming that Jesus is not God, and the first chapter of the Gospel of John emphatically tells us that Jesus is indeed God. And I just love it when things fit together like that. So let's start reading. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. That word comprehend is sometimes translated as apprehend or overcome. So because this is a video on the teachings of Jesus Christ, let's stop there and actually examine what is being described in the text. In the beginning was the word. This obviously is a throwback to Genesis 1.1, which also starts off in the beginning. And the very next words there are God created the heavens and the earth. In John 1.1, by comparison, we are also immediately talking about God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's an elaboration on this in verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. Now, you can't go any further back in terms of Scripture because Scripture starts at Genesis 1.1 with God creating the heavens and the earth than to say that something was in the beginning with God. And now in verse 3, we bring in the creation. All things came into being, or were created, were formed through Him. That is, through the Logos, through the Word, through Jesus Christ, as we will see in a few verses. And apart from Him, the Word, Jesus, nothing came into being that has come into being. So that entails the entire creation story. That takes into account all of Genesis 1 and the beginning of Genesis 2, where we find the macro creation story, and then also the creation of man in Genesis 2, which is an elaboration and expansion of Genesis 1.26. In him was life. This is important because he has life in himself. And if you fully understand what's being said here, this destroys any concept that Jesus is somehow a created being. He wasn't given life, in him was life. And the life, the existent nature of Christ, his life was the light of men, of mankind. So when I say the existent nature, it's probably not the best term to use. What I'm getting at is the I am, Yahweh, right? The name, if you will, that God gives himself when Moses asks his name. He gives Moses the name Yahweh meaning literally, I am. And we also know that God and Jesus both use the title Alpha and Omega. They are not created. And this is where we get the terms pre-existent, co-eternal, eternal in general, really, <laughs> right? We only get co-eternal when we start talking about the different persons of the Godhead, meaning the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, of course. So before we go any further, it probably would be helpful to touch on the doctrine of the Trinity, at least. I think what's really discussed in John chapter 1, probably more than anything else, is the divinity of Christ. And it might be more accurate to say that the main topic is the nature of Christ, who he is, what he is, but who and what he is, is divine. And John is very clear about that. So just to touch on the doctrine of the Trinity, at least, we can break the Trinity down into these six propositions. And I'm taking this directly from Blue Letter Bible. There is one God. This one God is a single divine being called Jehovah or Yahweh in the Old Testament. 
right? So there are other spiritual beings, but there are no other divine beings. There are no other gods. And if you believe that there are other gods, you do not hold to the classical doctrine of the Trinity at all. You don't even have the basis for it. So you can stack these other doctrines on top of it all you like. It still will not become the Trinity, not as it's been defined classically. Anybody who has done any amount of study on the Trinity would know this. But I say it because there are people out there who talk about how there are other Elohim and how there are literally a council of gods, right? Like they misunderstand Psalm 82.6 and some other very key passages. There are people who have made up entire doctrines around this, and there are people who have made up religions around this, such as Mormonism. There are other people who haven't made up a religion around it, but say some pretty wacky things. And you can go watch my very old videos about Michael Heiser for more on that. Um, I will say that people like Chris Roseboro and James White have come out and said Michael Heiser's very wrong, and I really wish that those people would say it a little louder, because the average person out there who listens to Michael Heiser isn't hearing you guys. They're only hearing people like me, and they don't believe that I have the qualifications to challenge Michael Heiser, even on things where he's just clearly wrong. So enough of that rabbit hole. That's <laughs> We could spend hours and hours on that alone. Number three, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is God. The Son, Jesus Christ, is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And sort of parenthetically here, they're saying the Lord. That is the Lord in all capital letters, meaning Yahweh. Number six, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are each someone distinct from the other two. So the easy way to think about this, in my opinion, is that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. But the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Father, right? And vice versa. When Brandon Tatum challenged the divinity of Christ, he said things like, Oh, Jesus was praying to himself then? Well, no, he, he's not praying to himself. He's praying to the Father. He's the Son. He's one person of the Godhead, and he is God, and he's also fully man, just for the record, okay? I'm not going to go too far off into the hypostatic union, but he's fully God. He's fully man. Let's just say that for now. There are plenty of videos out there on that topic if you want to find more information on that. When we say the word was God, we are denoting that the nature of the word was God. I mean, in Greek, we're saying God, Theos, was the word. Remember, the sentence structures are different. So it sounds kind of different when we say that, doesn't it? The word was God. God was the word. And God, Theon, was with the word. And we'll read in a moment about how the word became flesh. If the word is God, then God. God became flesh, right? This specific person who we've indicated throughout the first five verses as being God and also being with God in the beginning and all things being created through him becomes flesh. But before we get there, how do we know this? Verse six, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. And remember, the light is the life that is inside the word, right? It's inside him, Jesus. And indeed, the light is Jesus. Jesus is the light because the light is God and Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. So that's why Jesus says, walk in the light while you have the light or while the light is with you. So John was not the light. He was a man who was sent from God to testify about the light. So when people say that Jesus was a man sent by God, no, because we have a distinction here between what he is and what John is. There was the true light which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. And this is really interesting because it brings up all sorts of ideas about Genesis 1, where Elohim, God, is speaking. And so there are words, but suffice to say that we know Jesus is not just a spoken word at creation. That idea will be thrown around sometimes as well, because in John 17, 5, we learn that Jesus had glory with the Father before the world existed. So there was a time before 
in the beginning of Genesis 1, where God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were existing in glory. And we could hypothesize about all sorts of things, but this is what we know. I'm more interested in solid teachings and what we know, especially for our purposes here. So, speaking of Jesus as the light of men, speaking of God as being light, there was the true light which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. Clearly, we're talking about Jesus here, right? But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. And there's quite a lot of elaboration on this in the New Testament. For example, the adoption of sons that Paul talks about. And in the world, people tend to talk about, oh, everyone is a child of God. Um, that's not how the Bible uses that term. And if you're a Christian, you should probably stick to the Bible. So, to those that received him... He gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So this is being born again. We will talk about that when we get to John 3. I don't want to go too far into that right now. Verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. So again, he's born in the flesh after John. We know that from Luke 1. John's mother Elizabeth was in her sixth month of pregnancy when Mary conceives. And John the Baptist, of whom we're talking about, by the way, literally leaped in his mother's womb when Mary came near him after she had conceived Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And yet John says, he who comes after me has existed before me. So anyone saying he's just a man, I mean, that's a pretty outrageous statement, okay? It is really really off the wall in terms of scripture. You would have to throw out this entire chapter and many, many chapters of scripture just to even try to make that fit. I mean, I'd hate to see the Bible after you're done tearing out the pages, but it would be much lighter and quicker to read when you were done. Verse 16, for of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. So we've all received his fullness through faith through being born again of the Spirit, and we've received His grace in abundance. We've received grace upon grace and more grace, right? And that's literally how it is. None of us deserve really anything other than death and condemnation for our rebellion against God, but we don't receive that. We receive light and life and grace and fullness. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were given through Jesus Christ, were given, were realized, were brought about through Jesus. So this is a verse that I kept bringing up when I was addressing the Torah stuff, the Hebrew roots doctrines, quote unquote, where they try to keep the Torah. They're always hearkening back to the Torah. I've even heard them say that Jesus is the Torah incarnate, like whatever that means, right? <laughs> Literally whatever that means. Jesus brought a better revelation of God's word than the Torah that was given through Moses, the law that was given through Moses. We have absolute proof of this if you believe the words of Christ. For example, when he's asked about divorce, that a man could give a writ of divorce to his wife for any reason. And Jesus says that it's because of the hardness of their hearts that Moses gave them that law. But from the beginning, God had created them male and female, and it was for that cause that a man would leave his father and mother and cling unto his wife, and the two would become one flesh. That which God unites, let no man separate. And so Jesus allows very few reasons for divorce, even though the law of Moses said something slightly different, right? So 
which is the more full revelation of God's law? It's obviously the revelation that came through Christ, because the one that was given to the ancient nation of Israel had to work in the system that they had. It had to work in the world that they lived in. God commanded very specific things for very specific reasons, and we're actually told this in Scripture. I wouldn't want to come up with this if it wasn't actually in God's Word and explained to us in this manner. For example, Jesus goes further with the moral commandments. He says, oh, but if you lust after a woman, you have committed adultery in your heart. Well, I mean, why didn't they stone people for that under the Torah then? Because Jesus is enlightening us to the fact that these other things are also sins, but God did not command that people be stoned for them because, gosh, if he did, wouldn't everyone in the ancient nation of Israel have been stoned? There would have been no one left. They wouldn't have even made it through the wilderness. You would have came out with one guy on the other end because no one else would have been around to stone him to death. Even being angry at your brother without just cause becomes like murder. I mean, imagine if you were going to be treated as though that really were murder. Again, as soon as this came up and a person was angry with someone and it wasn't completely justified, they'd be stoned for murder. So in other words, there are parts of God's law which could not be given through Moses because the standard would have been far too high. Matthew 5 illustrates how incapable we are of truly keeping God's law and having righteousness in and of ourselves. And that illustrates our need for the gospel. It illustrates our need for the sacrifice of Christ as a sin atonement on our behalf and a perfect sin atonement on our behalf, which can wipe away all sin. So it's really very silly once you understand this to try and be a Hebrew Roots believer, a quote unquote Torah keeper, because we're all trying to keep the law of God. But the question is, which law is that? And we have the most perfect revelation of it for us through Jesus. And that's really what John 1 says. In him was life. This is, again, talking about his real life, not like the life that we've been given, but the life that just exists in him as God. And that life was the light of men. That was verse 4. And that was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. Verse 9. So I think we've covered everything that I wanted to cover in this video, except for verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. This verse can be quite confusing to people. Um, I've heard a lot of people ask questions about this. How is it that no one has seen God? Obviously, in the Old Testament, there are people who they see God in some way, shape, or form. And if John is telling us that John the Baptist testified as to the life of Christ and that the disciples obviously saw Christ, if he's God, then clearly we've seen God, right? So God here is not expressing the fact that no one has seen Jesus. It is clearly telling us that we have seen Jesus. So it basically reads, the one and only Son, or the only begotten Son, of God, of Theon. We're clearly talking about the Son of God the Father and the only begotten, if you will, Son of God the Father. And then there's an indication again that he himself is God. The word Theos is used again in describing the Son. And it basically goes on to say that he was with the Father, he was at his side, or in the bosom of the Father. That's actually a great translation. That's an even better translation. He has explained him, or he has made him known. And if we put this in the frame of Christian theology, through his actions and through his teachings, he's led us to him and revealed him or shown him to us. Because Christ says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Christ didn't do his own will. He came to do the will of the Father. Obviously, we know that God is spirit. Those who worship him, worship him in truth and spirit. And so this is in no way saying that God has not shown himself to people in visions and dreams. And frankly speaking, we don't know how all that works, okay? We only have our limited human understanding. We do not know what God is doing all the time. We only know what he reveals to us. And that's absolutely all we need to know about God. If we needed to know more, God would tell us more. God knows what we need, and he knows what we know. 
and therefore he knows what we need to know, right? <laughs> and uh, I don't believe that God would leave out things that were necessary for us to know. I think that's clearly anti-biblical even to believe. So <laughs> I think it goes without saying that we do not know exactly how each prophet of the Old Testament communicated with and or saw God at times other than what we can learn from studying those texts. And there's a lot to study and to talk about there. We don't have time to go into it in this video, obviously. But you have Moses seeing God, you have him talking to God on Mount Sinai, Sinai if you prefer the pronunciation, when he receives the tablets. He talks to him in the burning bush before that. He sees God pass by another time, well after he's received the law. We know that Moses saw God in some way, shape, or form because the glory that he was looking at left his face glowing, so much so that the Israelites couldn't even look at Moses. He was shining like the sun, but God also makes it clear in the Old Testament that if someone could actually look on him, on the Father, and I believe it's saying specifically face to face, that they would just die. I mean, the high priest had to tie a rope around his leg just to go into the Holy of Holies in case it killed him <laughs> so that they could drag his body back out without anyone else going into the Holy of Holies because it would kill them next if they did. So God is so far above us, and, and that's why it's kind of hard for us to wrap our mind around the nature of God even and to fully comprehend this. All we can do is take God at his word and believe what he's revealed to us in Scripture. So I think it's very clear that verse 18 is talking about the fact that no one has seen the Father in the way that we've seen Jesus. We've not looked on his face. We've not truly understood him on our own, but Jesus has revealed him to us. I try to do something special for those of you who make it this far into the video. <laughs> and so I wanted to give you all a really beautiful and brilliant parallel to John chapter 1, and that is Colossians 1, starting at verse 15. He, speaking of Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He, verse 17, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. That is, speaking of the fullness of the Godhead or the fullness of deity. And what is our role to be? Verse 28, we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. If I'm to leave you with any questions to reflect on today, I guess it would be, is that power working mightily within you? And do we proclaim Christ? I hope you guys have gotten something out of this little video. I want to make more of these. If you have any questions or you want to add something or I got something wrong, certainly go ahead and leave me a comment. If you just want to say hi, comments are always helpful. They do good things with the YouTube algorithm and I assume that they'll do good things on other platforms as well as YouTube becomes a little too strict for its own good. But yeah, comments are great, and we'll continue the Gospel of John very soon. I have every intention of making this an ongoing thing that I do, along with other videos, of course. We can meander our way through. I feel like it's a no-brainer that we all need to read and to think about and to talk about God's Word more, and I feel like God was clearly pointing me in this direction. So thank you all for stopping back to the channel. I always appreciate the support, and God bless each and every one of you. Grace and peace to you all. In the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ.